pray that you would continue to give her strength in all that, all that she does. Lord, as we open your word tonight, we pray that you'd open our hearts as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Revelation chapter 2. This is the third of the, of the seven churches that John has been ordered to write to by the resurrected Lord. And this church is a very, uh, as I was preparing lessons, this one's hit me probably the hardest of all of them. You remember the, uh, the Ephesian church? They were doing everything right except for one thing. They'd lost their first love. And what they, what, what they were doing is they were doing all the what things, but they didn't have the why down pat. Their motivation just wasn't there. It's easy to lose that fervor that love, and to just drift away. Then last week, we looked at another church. It was, it was a good uh, church that, in fact, it's one of the two churches that nothing was wrong with when, when John wrote to them, the church at Smyrna. They were a persecuted church that had great power. This week, we're going to look at a worldly compromising church. Now, remember, these are seven literal churches that really existed in Asia Minor. They had seven pastors, who were messengers, who were taking these letters to them. But there are also types of Christians and types of churches that have existed from the, from the, from the beginning. There, are always been, there will always be churches that are doing the right thing and have left their first love. There will always be churches where people are being persecuted, but they're a powerful church. And today we're going to look at uh, one I, I fear is unfortunately way too common in our society, worldly compromising churches. We've always, I put this on your first paragraph here, the church has always struggled to understand a valuable lesson throughout our history, and this is really important. The greatest danger almost never comes from outside, it comes from within. And we're so focused on dealing with the outside that we, that we miss the, the issues that come from within. And how does that happen? Because if you're familiar with Greek mythology and the, the story of the Trojan War and the Trojan horse and how they, they were able to sneak all the soldiers in, I think from the Spartans, inside that horse, and then they brought it in. A lot of Christians do that. A lot of churches do that. And, and their desire to, be, to win people, they become pragmatic and utilitarian. What I mean by that? If it works, we do it. It doesn't matter if it's biblical or not, is it, does it work? And so what begins to happen is we begin to lower our standards. We begin to compromise. The Word of God is no longer the authority. Now it's the latest poll. It's the latest fad, the latest uh, ism that's out there, and we begin to embrace it. Um, and nothing will poison a body like that. I've got a few quotes that I found. Um, David Levy said, Compromise has been a cancer in the church from its inception. A.W. Tozer, a great saint of long, uh, last cent two centuries ago, said a new decalogue has been adopted by the neo-Christians of our day. Thou shalt not disagree. And a new set of beatitudes, too. Blessed are they that tolerate everything, for they shall not be made accountable. Now, this is, a, this is 150 years ago. What, what, what insight he had. Francis Schaeffer, who did a lot to change the, the Christian culture in the late 60s and in the 70s to bring us towards a more rational thinking culture rather than an anti-intellectual culture, said this, truth always carries confrontation. You probably, if you've been listening to Pastor Mike on, uh, on Sunday morning on 2 John and 3 John, he's been emphasizing the same, same, truth, same truth. Truth demands confrontation, loving confrontation nevertheless. If our reflex action is always accommodation of the centrality of the truth involved, there is something wrong. By nature, 30 to 40% of people's personalities don't like conflict. There are several of you in here. Okay? Most of us, there's a few of us, about 10% of people live for conflict. When I was doing my research on, on marital marriage, it was really interesting because that's the, that's the statistical population of the country that 10% of the population are what we call type A, a really high driven, it's my way or the highway, they like a challenge. It's 50% of the Marine Corps. 10% of the population, 50% of the Marine Corps. Why is that? Maybe you can be one of us. The few, the proud. And we got commercials, people 
jumping out of airplanes and coming down with your machine guns and climbing mountains. We attract that 10%. I also found something else in my research that opposites attract. And so that 10% of the population that's now 50% of the Marine Corps usually marries somebody who is opposite of them. And they're much more passive, they're much more relational, and they're, the thing that drives them is something called peace. Now, I want you to think about a third truth I learned about in marriage, my dissertation. Opposites attract, and then they attack. So what brought this hard charge in the Marine to be attracted to this very passive, very relational young lady was, wow, she can, she's, not, she's so different than me. I love that. Then after a while, and she goes, oh, he's so take charge. I need a man who's going to take charge and make things happen. And then after a while, uh, he's so abrasive. He never shares his feelings. He's always in a hurry. He likes confrontation. And he's like, she cannot make up her mind where we're going to eat or what we're going to have. Now, the reason I bring that up, that's the population of, 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 of our church, half and half there. And if you don't like conflict, what will you do to avoid it? If that's your number one thing, if you like peace, what will you do to avoid conflict? Almost anything. Now, I don't believe that we should go searching for conflict for the sake of conflict. That's called being rude or being a jerk. It is. But there are some things that are worth living for and worth standing for and worth dying for. If you stand for nothing, why are you even living? Some truths are worth fighting for. The Bible is the infallible, inspired Word of God. Absolutely worth fighting for. No one should stand in this pulpit who does not believe that. You should throw them out on their ear, literally, or on their head. Maybe it'll knock some sense into them. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Absolutely worth fighting for. Why? Because it's true. And if you don't believe that, you're on your way to hell. That's why it's worth fighting for. And unfortunately, too many people are so embraced with this concept called tolerance. You know what tolerance is, right? Well, the world's definition of tolerance is you better agree with me or we're going to be intolerant towards you. But the biblical definition of, or the, the dictionary definition of tolerance is we allow, allow everybody to have different opinions. And that's okay, except when you're dealing with the core truths of Scripture. There are certain things that we have to agree on, and if you can't agree on them, then you're not technically a Christian. There are some things that aren't necessarily important. Some people believe you should wear ties to church, and some people think you shouldn't. Is that an argument that you want to have? I hope not. Is that something you'll, you'll shoot somebody over? I hope not. Okay? There are churches that split because they have pew chairs instead of pews. That's not even a secondary issue. That's like a third or fourth level issue. Or they don't like the color of the hymnal or the color of the carpet. That's ridiculous stuff. But when we're talking about core stuff, you should fight. So what's the problem in the church today, and I believe we've taken this to an extreme, is the church is just like the world. And there's a philosophy out there that says if you want to bring the world in, then you need to look like the world, act like the world, smell like the world, sing like the world. So why should they want to be like us then? What does Jesus say about the world system? Let me give you a few thoughts from the scriptures. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul said, Romans chapter 12, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First John puts it this way, and John, put, John, the author of Revelation, puts it this way in First John 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is what? Who knows the rest of that? It's not of the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide. James, who really had a, had a hard time expressing himself, said, you adulterers and adulteresses, 
That's what he called people that love the world. How's that for a nice, friendly, tolerant term? He said, friendship with the world is enmity or hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Our buddy James also said, pure religion is keeping oneself unstained from the world. Titus said, the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, why am I spending all this time on in, in an introduction? Because this is a really important topic in our day. And I believe there are some well-meaning people who have slipped here. And when you're, by the way, when you're in this, you don't even see it sometimes. I would, as we work through this message to this church here, I really want you to look at our, it's easy to pick on this church and say that they're all messed up. They're worldly and compromising. But let's look at our own lives. Because the church is made up of people, right? Let's look at our own lives as we go through this and see, are there areas that we've compromised the truth on? That we've kind of said, you know, I, don't, I just don't want to take that stand that I need to take. So let's look at Revelation chapter 2, and we'll read from verses 12 down through verse 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you'll hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas my faithful, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwelt. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, I've had questions and question and answer time and asked me this question. Pastor Mark, what is that new name? I want you to read that verse. No one knows. It's amazing the kind of questions we ask, right? So what's going on here? Well, let's start with the church itself, um, and, and then we'll work to the Christ of the church. I don't think we're going to get about maybe halfway through the lesson tonight. But I don't want to rush through it because it's such an important message. So if you remember that map I gave you, I think, Brother, uh, you got that? There we go. There, thank you. We see the Isle of Patmos, and then we did the Ephesian church, the Smyrna church. Now Pergamum, all these, these first two are right on the coast, but Pergamum is about 15 miles inland. It's, it's part of the, of the route, though, for the, this, thank you, for the, um, basically the mail route, how they would get from spot to spot to spot. It was considered uh, probably one of the most important churches, uh, ch churches, most important cities of its time. Pliny, the Roman uh, historian, said it was the most distinguished city in Asia. By the time John wrote Revelation, it had been Asia's capital for 250 years. By the way, you can still go there today. It's called Bergama now. It's in the, it's in the nation of Turkey. Unlike Ephesus, it, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't a port city. It wasn't a, a great major trade route. But it was built on top of this huge conical hill about um, 1,000 feet above the plain. So just imagine you're on this pl plain and you look up and there's this city up on top of a hill. It had the second greatest library in existence at the time. The Egyptians had in Alexandria had, had the primary one. This one had over 200,000 volumes. You say, Mark, that's not a lot of books. It is when they're all handwritten. They had to make their paper. In fact, what the, what the Pergamans tried to do is get the librarian from Alexandria to come down to their library to make it the largest. The Egyptians found out about it 
And not only did they not let the librarian go, they stopped shipping paper to them. So the Perga, the people from, I'm going to call them Pergamons, whatever, the people from Perga, there's like four different ways, the Pergamines, depends on who you look at, uh, said, you know what? You're not going to sell us paper? We'll invent our own. And they did. You might have heard of something called a parchment. It made of treated animal skins. Um, it was actually known a thousand years earlier in Egypt, but they perfected the process. And many people think the word parchment derives from the word pergamum. They were known for their, for the, their culture, for their learning. Um, the great physician Galen, who was sacred only to Hippocrates in ancient times, uh, was from that city. They saw themselves as a defender of the Greek culture in Asia. And they were the main place for worshiping of false gods. And here's where it becomes an issue. They didn't just have one false god, they had several. There were at least four main ones. Athena, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Zeus were all, had temples there. But that wasn't their major issue. The biggest issue they had is something called emperor worship. You see, the Roman emperor said, I'm God, and you will worship me as God. He required a sacrifice one day a year from every person in the kingdom. They actually built two temples in that city to the emperor. They took emperor worship very seriously. So you're a Christian, and you live in a place where they say, Jesus is not God, emperor is God. Can you see there might be a possible conflict and they were basically the center of this cult. In fact, when I read that passage, we talked about a man named Antipas who was martyred there. He was actually put in a bronze bull and they boiled him because he wouldn't worship their false gods, so they put him in one of their false gods. This was a very anti-God culture. And it's really easy to say, well, those people, they should have just stood up for the Lord and, and, and like we do. And there were some, as we see, that were very faithful. We'll talk about them. But there was a group that just compromised and were worldly and they said, you know what? We'll just get along to get along. And it, God calls them out on it. So as we look at this, we see that the city itself, but look at the Christ of the church at Pergamum here. Look at how he's described. He who has a sharp sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth. That doesn't sound to me like a guy who's saying you're doing a great job. Whenever we see the concept of a sharp two-edged sword in Scripture, Revelation 1.16, 2.12, 2.16, and Revelation 19, um, it represents the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to, to, to discern the thoughts and intents of the, of, of the heart. And all things are open and naked with him to whom we have to do. It's uh, When we look at the, the, the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And as I look at Revelation 19, 15, later on, John's going to write, we're talking about when Jesus comes back to the earth, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And... He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. You know what that's saying? The sword here represents judgment. And who's he judging? The world or the church? If I read the context, he's reading the church. He's going to judge the church here. See, one thing that God will not tolerate, and if you read the Old Testament, you're going to see this, he will not tolerate compromise. He will not share himself with another. He says, what's the very first commandment? You will have no other gods before me or in my presence, literally. And so what he's saying to this church right here is, yeah, you worship me, but you also have all these other things that you put on par with it. Two weeks from now, because we're not having a service next week, I'm going to go through a list of things that I think the American church has done uh, and has adopted where we're a lot like this church. Some people will worship a, 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 a political party more than Jesus. 
in the churches. Yeah? Some churches is the Republican Party and some churches is the Democratic Party. But they will worship a party. And what we're going to see here is no one and nothing should be on par with God. I'm, I'm more and more convinced as I'm studying through the Scripture that our focus needs to be on Jesus and Him crucified. And the focus needs to be on what the Word of God says rather than on politics. Because politicians come and go. Countries come and go. Bills come. I remember when I was young, we were all worried about global cooling. The earth was going to freeze again. And then there was Y2K. Remember that one? And then there was global warming. And then now it's called, it's called climate change. And just wait. It'll get, we call it something else. There's always going to be a crisis. There's always going to be something. What should our focus be? On oh, God. When he comes back, guess what? He's coming back. Can you stop it? Can I stop it? No. Until he comes back, we need to live for him. And so as we look at this author here, it's Jesus. He has the sharp two-edged sword. He's the one who says disaster is going to loom for this church. If you don't, he says, he, he says, I will come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth in verse 16. If you don't repent, it's going to be bad for you, church. That, to me, is a pretty scary um, admonition. And I think this church is symbolic of many churches throughout history that have compromised with the world. If you're familiar with history, you might have heard of the Edict of Milan, or you might have heard of somebody named Constantine. Anybody ever heard of him? He kind of legalized Christianity and ordered everyone to be converted. Now, I want you to think about that. Ominous Dominus, you are now converted. Now, do you think everybody repented and trusted Christ as their Savior? Or have they just got nominal religion? And what they did is they took their own personal beliefs, they came out, they Christianized them, and they nationalized them, and they had this golden corral smorgasbord full of um, your views, my views, and the, and, the, and, the, and the country's views, Rome's views, and put it all together. So it was no longer a personal relationship with the Lord. It was a national identity. There were Christian nations, and there were Muslim nations. You might have heard of the Crusades. This is what happens when you go down the wrong trail, and that's exactly what happened. They married political; they were married to the political system so that the church was synonymous with the nation. And you had corruption. Follow the history of the Roman Catholic Church through the Middle Ages, and and what happened in England and what happened in, in France, and what happened in America, and what is happening today. There are entire denominations that have departed from the truth of the Word of God. There are denominations that deny the Bible is the Word of God, that deny that Jesus is God. They call themselves Christian. But they will fight for some social issue, they will fight for some financial issue, some economic issue. They've missed it. This is what Jesus is warning against. So look at the commendation here in verse 13. I like this. There's some good stuff. And aren't you glad God starts out with the good stuff before the bad stuff? All the way through this, these seven churches, he says, here's what you're doing right. Here's what I need you to fix. Good lesson for you, by the way, when you want to correct somebody. Don't, always, don't only focus on the negative. Don't only do something when you're talking to a child or, or, or a subordinate and it's only corrective. There needs to be some positive, too. I know your works. Let's just start there. When you live in a culture that is not only not hospitable to Christianity, but is anti-Christian, um, one of the things that Jesus says about them is that you're faithful. I know your works. And I know where you live. Remember, the church we looked at last week, Smyrna, they had Satan's synagogue. Here he says, uh, you dwell where Satan's throne is, and then later he says, you are where Satan dwells. So Satan's synagogue, that's, that's a Jewish contingent that's out to kind of get the, those Christians, but they were much smaller. They were a small group, but they weren't everybody. Here you got a church that's surrounded literally by a satanic system. It'd be like combining Las Vegas, I hope nobody's from any of these cities, New Orleans, I don't know, in San Francisco, and their politics, and you jam them all together, and you're surrounded by that. I was in, the, in San Francisco in the 90s during the Rodney King riots, so that kind of a mindset. 
that just anti-God. In fact, they were, throwing, they were throwing rocks at our sister church because they had a speaker come in who said that homosexuality was a sin. Three members of the Board of Education were openly homosexual. That's, why, that's when we became homeschoolers in 1990 because we realized that we couldn't put our children in those schools. That's like living in the, in, the, in the seat of Satan. And our society is becoming like that. But he says, you hold fast to my name. Notice the, the personal pronouns here. My name, my faith, my faithful martyr. Uh, there's, there's an emphasis on God saying, I, I see that you are standing for me. Now, some people have identified Satan's throne as the altar of Zeus. Uh, this is just some history. There was a, a, there was a huge Acropolis. Uh, it had a colonnade of 120 by 112 feet. The podium of the altar was 18 feet high. That's pretty high, by the way. That's, that's a 17-foot ceiling. So just figure how high that, that is. Um, and then there was a, a frieze, F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, which is a, a, a battle portrait that had the battle of the gods against the battle of the giants. There was this huge thing that was laid out. It was, it was really, if you like Hellenistic art, it was, it, was, it was a great representation of that. Other people associate Satan's throne with the worship of the god Asclepios. Now, supposedly Asclepios was the god who healed everybody. And they, if you've probably seen um, some, I think they call it, what do they call it, caduceus, where they have the, the snake wrapped around that comes from ancient Greeks. Well, they, they believe that snakes had healing powers. So how would you how would some of you like this religion? You either sleep or lay down on the temple floor, hoping to be touched by one of the snakes. They just let hundreds of snakes just go, go loose, and thereby be healed. Anybody anyone want to sign up for that one? Any big snake fans? Okay. Some people think that's the the um, the throne of Satan. During the Emperor Diocletian's time, some Christian stonecutters were executed because they refused to carve the image of this god. Others point out that it might be the, the emperor worship that might make it the, 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 the uh, Satan's throne. Here's what I think. It's a combination of all that. All that stuff was going on. No matter where they turned, there was ungodliness. So you turn this way, it's there. You turn this way, it's there. And it can be overwhelming. You ever been in, in, a, in, in that, constantly surrounded by that? I remember when I was on a deployment once, we were getting ready to deploy, and we were staying in an open squad bay, and some of the guys put pornography on. And it was on this huge TV. And so I put on my earmuffs, I turned in, in this way, and it was just so hard to block all that out. And then the music would come on that was just ungodly, and it was just overwhelming. And I had to go find places to escape from that. That kind of a, 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 of a situation was, was going on. But ultimately, the emperor worship thing, I think, is the worst. They loved their country so much, their state so much, that patriotism had crossed the line into idolatry. Is there anything wrong with loving your country? No. I was a Marine for 28 years. I love my country. I still think we should say the Pledge of Allegiance. I think we should stand for the flag and honor it. I got no problem with that. I think we should respect those in authority. I think the Bible is very clear on that. Uh, should my country ever take the place of God and his word? Can my country be wrong? Absolutely, it can. Uh, I think Christians should be the best citizens. They had to say only Caesar is Lord if they were going to be good citizens there, not Christ. They were told that they could have faith but it had to be a private faith. Does this sound familiar? You can't have a public faith. You can have a private faith. And that's the kind of mindset that was being pushed during that whole time. And Jesus knew the peril that, play, that placed him that placed him, in. He said, you are faithful. And, I, and I'm thankful that you're faithful. I know your works. I know where you dwell. I know where you live, that you hold fast the name of Christ and you don't deny the faith. They embodied Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Faithfulness is good, even in the days of Antipas. Imagine watching somebody listening 
excuse me, to somebody burning to death in a bronze bull, the screams, and yet Jesus said, that's my faithful martyr. And even when you heard that, you remained faithful. That word witness in Scripture is the word martyr. Uh, it originally meant someone who saw something. But the word martyr got, came to mean much more than that. It came to mean someone who saw something and, and testified of it and then paid the penalty for doing that because they stood against the world. So he was, he was saying, you guys are doing really well. If you had been following the news lately, you know that some of this stuff still happens today. In America, we've been shielded from that for many decades. Somewhere today, Christians are dying for trusting in Jesus. Somewhere today, women are being raped for claiming the name of Jesus. Christian children are being sold into slavery. Christian brothers and sisters are being impoverished, imprisoned, persecuted, and tortured. John Allen writes in his book, The Global War on Christians, 80% of all acts of religious discrimination in the world today are directed against Christians. 90% of all people killed on the basis of religious beliefs today are Christians. When's the last time you heard that? Remember earlier on during the, uh, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan when, when ISIS was big and there a lot of people were being decapitated for claiming to be Christians. Depending on the source, uh, between 100 thousand and 150,000 Christians are martyred annually. As believers, we must get God's perspective on these deaths. You know what God says about those deaths? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. For me to live is Christ, Paul said, and to die is gain. And when we get to Revelation 14, verse 13, it's going to say, then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. You see, this church, at least a, a, a large portion of this church, got it. They understood that there was not an excuse because you're living in a, satanic, a Satan's throne for you to live like Satan. They were faithful. And God said, I know your works. I can see what you're doing. And some of you are even martyred for me. Once again, look at you hold fast to my name. You didn't deny my faith, even in the days in which Anapis was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwelt. Aren't you glad that God notices when you take a stand? I've talked to Marines who said, I can't, I can't stay in the Marine Corps. I can't live for God in the Marine Corps. Yes, you can. Is it easy? No. By the way, there's, un there's unsaved people no matter where you go. No matter what job you have. Yeah, there's even unsaved people in churches. There's ungodliness in churches sometimes too. Can you think of a better mission field than the military? There might be, whatever God has you called to, right? You can live for the Lord like the people of Pergamos did if you get your why right. What do I mean by your why right? Why was the church at Ephesus called out for losing their first love? They were doing the right things, the what, but they'd lost their why. They'd lost their motivation they didn't understand or they'd forgotten why they were doing the right thing. When you're being persecuted like the church at Smyrna was and you're doing, the, you're doing the right things for the right reason, God will give you power. Here we see some people in Pergamos in the midst of a satanic influence. As bad as it gets, I don't think anybody in our country has been boiled late recently for... Um, claiming profession in Christ. But is it, is it going to get better or worse? I think it's going to get worse. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm probably not. That's when the light shines the brightest, when it's the darkest. Why am I emphasizing this? Jesus said, I know your works. I know that you're, what you're doing, uh, even though maybe nobody else might see it. I see it. I'm just going to quickly... Get us thinking. I want to read. I just want to read those last verse fourteen to seventeen again, and we'll, we'll pick it up in two weeks. So for the next two weeks, you got to kind of th wonder what's going to happen. Okay, there's going to be some negative things going on, but I have a few things against you. Now remember, last with the Ephesian church, I have this one thing against you. 
Now I've got a bunch of things against you. And we're going to see that they have some issues with morality because they're going to compromise their morality and they're going to compromise their theology. We're going to look at these people embracing the doctrine of Balaam. If you haven't read about Balaam, you've got time in the next two weeks to read about him. You can find him in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, uh, and, and, and in that area. Here's a man who was a prophet. Do you know why he was a prophet? This is a bad pun, because he was in it for the prophet. Now, in our modern day and age, do we, we have no preachers on TV at all who say, send me this amount of money, and I'll, get, and I'll send you an autographed picture of Jesus or a miracle prayer cloth. Yes, there was a guy who said that, and people sent him money. Now, who do they just, I mean, part of me says, well, if you're dumb enough to fall for that one, you probably deserve to lose your money. But part of me also says, how dare you misrepresent Jesus that way? We are going to learn about how these people thought that money was more important than godliness. We're going to learn about a group of people who embraced sexual immorality. you know why? Because the culture was doing it. The other religions were doing it. So let's go along to get along. And God says, I hate these things. And he's going to command them to repent. I wish we had another half hour, 45 minutes, but we don't. So we are going to close here with this final admonition. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you're doing the right things, keep doing them. But examine why you're doing it. Make sure you're doing them for the right motive. If you're not doing the right things, we'll look at that next time. Uh, here's the admonition from God. Repent. Should you hold on and wait until you feel like repenting? Or should repentance be immediately? It, it better be immediate, or God may come quicker than you may think. Brother John, if you come and lead us in, in some music and Please stand as we sing the invitation song.